A friend of mine has recently bought a number of these. They were supplied as kits and he's assembled all the kits but unfortunately none of them work and he's asked me to take a look at them to see if I can try and figure out what's going on. Uh, you may have seen these before, they are uh, BCD keyboard encoders, so a very simple device, it uses a pick in this case, uh, takes uh, input from a small key panel, encodes it as a BCD value and puts that out on four of the pins on this connector. And um, as I say, none of them work and so we kind of suspect that the problem is there is no code in the PIC. Um, as I say, they were supplied as kits. Um, I think the kits were originally manufactured back in 2005, so uh, quite an old design. Um, but as I say, it doesn't work, it doesn't do anything. All the outputs uh, stay low and uh, they all do exactly the same thing. Um, he did email me a copy of the instructions so I've printed that off and we'll use that as a reference. So it's a very simple circuit, it's just a keyboard matrix. The PIC is responsible for um, scanning the columns and energising the rows so it can figure out which particular key is pressed. Uh, it does appear that a link hasn't been fitted on the board but that is in place, it's just on the back in a different position so uh, that is fitted, that just connects uh, this sill to ground, um, but that is in place. Uh, also, he's bypassed the voltage regulator because he wants to run it directly on 5 volts, so it's connected like that. Again, that's fine. All seems to be uh, wind up as it's supposed to be. Uh, there should be an LED fitted, but unfortunately the holes on the board are too small. So what I'll do to start with is I'll just open the holes up, fit an LED so we can see what's going on. That's this LED. Uh, according to the instructions, it shows that power is on, um, but it's not connected across the power rails. It's actually connected to one of the outputs of the PIC. And if you're familiar with PICs, you'll know that the pins are all default inputs when you reset the device. So if it's an input, it will effectively be floating, uh, and so the LED won't come on unless the PIC actually starts up and initializes itself. Uh, so what we'll do is um, we'll go through, have a look at this, see if we can figure out what's going on. Um, I'll start by getting the LED fitted and we'll see if that comes on when we power the board up and we'll do the basics, we'll check the supplies, getting to the pick and um, see if the uh, outputs are doing anything at all. Um, but we suspect that the problem is the pick's not programmed, so uh, that being the case, we'll go through how to program the pick. Um, I don't have a programmed PIC, I don't have the binary file, um, but luckily the code is in the actual instructions. I only have this as a PDF, so we'll have to cut and paste it or type it out into um, a suitable program. But we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Firstly, I'll get the LED fitted and we'll do some basic testing. Okay, I've got it hooked up to the bench power supply. I fitted the LED, I've done a visual inspection and checked all the connections and it looks uh, fine. He's done a, a good job making this, so I don't think it's an assembly issue. I've got a feeling this has got something to do with the pick. Um, but we'll try giving a full test first, so I'll power it up. The supply is set to 5 volts. Um, this is quite an old pick, so it will work on 5 volts. Most modern picks don't, of course, work at 5 volts. This particular one does. And it's drawing two milliamps, so it's not uh, obviously doing very much. We'll bring in the test meter, check the supplies. So we want to see if we're getting power to the pick. So that's pin five for ground, pin 14 for power, and we should be getting five volts, of course. So we'll just test that. And pin 14. Um, as we can see, we're getting five volts. We'll just check to see if we're getting any activity on any of the lines. It should be scanning the keys and um, obviously encoding the, uh, the correct value when any particular key is pressed. So we'll try looking at the lines that are responsible for scanning the uh, keyboard. So that's pin 6. We're getting nothing at all. Just check the scope is uh, properly hooked up, which it is. Pin 7. Pin 8, pin 9. So as we can see, these are doing nothing at all. Uh, also the fact that they are 
all low does tend to indicate that they're being pulled low by the uh, the sill resistor uh, which in turn tends to indicate that the uh, pins are configured as inputs going into the pick and of course some of these should be configured as outputs. We'll check the uh, columns Again, they appear to be floating, so uh, it looks like the uh, pick just is not initialising. Back in the uh, early uh, 2000s, then most of these kits supplied the picks unprogrammed, and they did expect the builder to actually assemble and uh, program the picks, and so most likely it's completely unprogrammed, and the fact it doesn't have a label on. Uh, would tend to confirm that. Normally if there's a program in something it's got some sort of label. Uh, so what we'll do now is we'll go back to the um, software and step one is to get the software into a program we can use to compile it into a binary file that we can put into the PIC. Um, so we'll go over to the uh, PC, I'll take the PIC out, we'll start by trying to uh, read it. Now we won't be able to read it I suspect because PICs generally have copy protection bits um, but it will let us test to see if it's blank and if it is blank then of course it's um, uh, unprogrammed. These are flash devices so we should be able to reprogram it and uh, we'll go from there we'll see uh, if there's anything in it at all and if not uh, we'll import the uh, source code um, get it compiled, program the pick, and see if that resolves the issue. Okay, so we have the pick in the programmer. We'll select the correct device type. So in this case, it is a 16F627. So we'll select that. We'll try to read it. Now if it does have program data in, it almost certainly won't read because the protection bits will prevent it. But we'll still be able to check that it's not blank. If it is blank, it will just read as blank. So it'll just show three triple F um, indicating that uh, all the bits are unset. So we'll try and read it. And it is looking like it's blank. Um, we'll have a quick look and sure enough, the pick appears to be totally blank. So um, it's not surprising it doesn't work. Uh, as I said, quite often kits were supplied with the picks like this and um, it was expected that the builder would program these. So what we'll do now is we'll go through and extract the um, data, the source code, and then we'll try to compile it. Okay, so we'll start by cutting and pasting the program data, the source code, from the PDF. I don't know if this is the correct version, but it's very simple um, software, so if we need to, we could just write it from scratch. It's not really doing very much. Uh, but we'll try this first. So to start with, I'll select all the source code in the file. So I'll copy that. Now, of course, this isn't going to compile directly from the PDF um, for reasons I'll come to in a few minutes. Uh, but what I'll do before I go any further is I'll try and paste what I've copied into Notepad. And it is looking quite promising, so I have been able to copy the text. So the next thing I want to do is go to a program I can use to compile this source code. Um, modern picks, you'd use um, something like MPLabX, which is what I normally use for uh, current projects. But for older legacy projects, I still use MPLab version 8. Um, it is easier to use the older picks like this, and especially because this is an assembly, um, you don't really gain that much from using MPLab X and the extra complication of trying to use an old device in MPLab X means it's just usually far easier to use an older version. So I'll create a project folder on the hard disk. I'll open MPLab x 8.76 and then we'll create a new project and see if we can get this code to compile. So when we first open MPLabX with no project loaded 
then we get this screen. So step one is I need to create a project and uh, paste the source code that I've copied into, the pro into a project uh, file. So we'll start by selecting uh, new. We'll give the project a name. Let's call it keyboard scan. I'll browse to the uh, directory I want to save this to. And we've now got a blank project. So I want to add a source file to this and copy the source code into it. So we now have the file copied into this. Uh, of course, it won't compile like this and I'd normally go through this first and tidy it up. But what I'll do here is I'll show you what happens if you try to compile it. Now, firstly, we need to save this, otherwise it's not going to uh, be identified within the project. So we'll save the file. Um, again, we'll call it uh, KB scan. And it's an ASM assembly source code file. So we can leave that as it is. And you can see already that MPLAB has tried to identify instructions, directives, um, and the like to try to make this more readable. This file currently is not in the project though, so we need to save this into the project. So we'll save the file. I was just uh, control S. And now we need to add this file to the project. Okay, so we now have a project defined. We have the basic source code. As I say, it won't compile because it has all the uh, nonsense in that was in the PDF. But if we try to uh, compile this, then you'll see that uh, we have to select whether we want absolute or relocatable source code. Uh, in this case, we'll use absolute. It's not going to be, uh, it's not a library file or anything like that. There's no need for it to be relocatable. So we'll just select absolute. And now we're getting loads of uh, warnings. One of the things with MPLAB, as it says here, is it doesn't like certain things in its formatting. So it doesn't like opcodes being in the first column of the file. So we need to go through this file, tidy it up. Uh, anything after a semicolon, as you probably know, is a comment. Um, also with um, pigs, you have to decide whether you want to define the configuration flags within the source code or within the project. So you can either do it from here and select configuration bits, or you can define the, the are set in the source code, which is what we have here. If I'm starting a project from scratch, I normally uncheck this and set them here until it's working the way I want it. And then I'll uh, essentially duplicate those settings in the source code. But because this is the existing source code, we'll use this. Um, we do need to tidy this up because it's uh, spread across multiple lines, which is what we don't want. Um, the compiler won't like that. Uh, and then we need to take anything out of column one that is um, an opcode, otherwise it won't compile. Also, anything that's, that really should be a comment or is just information that's not part of the program, we can remove. So this, for example, is a page header that was in the PDF, so I'll just delete that. Uh, and then anything such as this, uh, we can simply take out of the first column. And then we can keep doing that, recompiling, and we should find that the number of errors starts to go down. Um, the easiest way, because most of it is uh, opcode, it's assembly, so uh, it tends to be mostly opcode. What I'll do is I'll select all of it, and we'll take that out of column one, and now we'll get the reverse problem that we'll have to take some labels and put them back into column one. Um, but there's fewer labels than there is opcodes, so it's easier to do it this way around. So for now, we we'll try and recompile. You'll see we're getting very few uh, errors now. And all I have to do is go back through and put anything back into the first column that is a label.
try compiling again. And I'm doing the same thing here. I'm just making sure the labels are in the first column and any opcodes are in any other column. Okay, we'll try compiling again. Okay, and it's now successfully built. So we should find that if we look into our uh, source code directory, we should now have a binary file that we should be able to use to program the pig. So we'll just have a quick look at that. And sure enough, here is our file. And it'd be quite small, it's just a small bit of code. And so what we'll do now is we'll try to program the pig and see if uh, it will actually now run in the board. So I'll call the programmer back up. So looking back at the programmer, we'll try to load the file we've just created. And we'll now try to program the pick. Okay, that's programmed. So we'll take the pick out of the programmer, pop it back in the board and see if that's resolved the issue. Okay, so I've popped the pick back into the board and we'll now power up the board and see if uh, anything happens. I suspect the LED should come on, but as I said earlier, it's actually controlled through one of the pins on the pick. So the pick does need to start up for that LED to come on. Uh, so we'll try powering it up. Again, I've got it set to 5 volts. And sure enough, the LED is now on. Reading the instructions, the LED should go out if a key is pressed. Which it is doing. And what we'll do now is we'll hook the scope up to each of the BCD pins and see what happens. So, first one. And as we can see, the scope responds to certain key presses. We'll try the next BCD line. Try different keys. And the next one. And the last one. Okay, well it appears to be working the way it's supposed to, so uh, it was just the case that there wasn't any firmware in the pick. Uh, so what I'll do now is I'll program, he sent me a number of these and I'll get the rest programmed, send them back to him and hopefully that has resolved the issue.